All right, welcome everyone to this week autonomy talks. All right, after the holidays, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today is a great pleasure to have uh, Sebastian Hörl, who is a researcher at the Institut de Recherche Technologique Système X in Paris. Uh, and there he works on various projects on agent-based transport simulation for passenger transport and logistics, building on, on uh, his PhD. Something uh, about uh, Sebastian, so he obtained a Master of Science in Complex Adaptive Systems at Halmers University uh, of Technology in Gothenburg. And then he worked on his PhD in transport planning at ETH Zurich. And actually we know him because he worked, uh, he established a collaboration with our institute uh, together with uh, Claudio Ruch. Uh, Sebastian's main interests revolve around the topics of uh, replicable use of open data and software in transport planning and uh, applied large scale transport simulation. Indeed, uh, uh, he is the author of many, many articles about this open data and software in, in these domains. Today he's gonna to talk about some of his recent research and we are very excited to hear what he's gonna talk about. So Sebastian, go ahead, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yes, as you said, uh, well, until a year ago, I was still um, doing my PhD at ETH Zurich. And actually most of the things I want to show today, they are uh, basically related to the things I was doing there. And, continuing to work on these topics. Um, but the focus here will be uh, automated taxis and what uh, system impact they have on the transport system. And uh, especially we want to look at this with agent-based simulation. And um, for that, I split the talk in two parts. So first I will really talk specifically about some applications for automated taxis and some analysis uh, thereof. And afterwards, I will talk a bit, how can we actually make these large simulations that we do, how can we make them replicable so that uh, when you read a paper where we use these simulations that somebody else can do the same and actually verify, do these results make sense? And uh, so these are these two parts, talking about automated taxis and then um, how to make these simulations replicable. Okay. So uh, I like to start these talks with a slide like this, because here we see a street in 1900. <clears throat> so we see that there's a lot of uh, interaction going on. There's a lot of people on the street selling things. There are some uh, vehicles, but not motor driven vehicles. And uh, they're kind of all sharing the space here. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of inefficiencies, but also a lot of things uh, where we might say, okay, maybe having a better use of the street, there we could have also some lessons for today. Because when we look here at 1900, this is transformed today into something like this, where we move tons of metal into the city in the morning and tons of metal out of the city in the afternoon. Um, each of these persons is carrying, as I said, a couple of tons of metal uh, around them. And uh, most uh, of the day, all these vehicles that they have, they will just stand around somewhere, occupy space without uh, having any use for the, for the people. So now we can say, this is obviously also not ideal with all the emissions caused by this, the congestion, the time lost and so on. So the interesting thing to think about here is that from 1900 to this state today, there was a lot of points where people could have made a decision to say, for instance, that we will focus more on public transportation, we focus more on collective transportation, but uh, in a way we followed this path to this very individualized uh, transport. And um, there one could may ask why uh, did this happen? There are many reasons. One reason could be maybe we didn't understand uh, really what will be the system impact of uh, this technology of the car when it was introduced. So basically scaling this up. And today we are in a similar situation because there's also a lot of technological change going on. So we talk about autonomous mobility, we talk about mobility as a service, mobility on demand, electrification, even aerial mobility, where you have kind of drones transporting passengers. So these are all kind of the, the new technologies and also buzzwords that are floating around. And what we try to do with our transport simulations is to find out what are actually the benefits, what are 
of, of these technologies, what are the problems that come with them, and also how should we shape policy and how should we make use of these technologies such that we arrive at a better state uh, than we are today. And uh, this is the big question and uh, what we were doing here at ETH Zurich, what I will show, is to uh, assess exactly these questions for automated taxis. So how do we do this? We do this with transport simulation. And um, there we have to look at some large differences between how transport simulation is done traditionally and how it is done today or what we need today. Because if you look at classic uh, transport planning, we usually look at different zones. So each city is a certain zone. There are flows between these zones. So this may be a certain amount of people traveling in the morning peak hour. Uh, from zone to zone, maybe we can even split this up into different user groups, but basically we look at large packages of people moving from relatively large areas to other relatively large areas. And uh, this way we can do macroscopic analysis, which is which works nicely if we look at uh, flows on the on the road. So if we look at uh, individual uh, passenger transport it works also nicely when we look at large trains because we can always estimate, okay, there's a certain flow of people that wants to go from A to B. And for a long time, this has been used to decide on, let's build a new highway, let's build a new metro line, because this way we can serve the demand that we have or that will be coming in a certain area of the city. Now, today we have reached a limit on what we can build in terms of infrastructure. So what happens in the transport system is that we try to make it more efficient by using digital technology, by uh, using uh, communication between uh, devices, by using kind of centralized services. So if you think of services like uh, Uber or other on-demand services there, we basically try to make use of the traffic infrastructure, ideally pooling uh, people to make everything more efficient than how well, this works in reality is another question, but basically we're at this point where we don't want to build new roads, but we try at least to use the given infrastructure in a better way. However, if we use all these technologies where a user can just use uh, the app and then see uh, what kind of services are available, this is a challenge for transport simulation because how do we predict if we put a certain fleet in a city of taxis, uh, if we put in new uh, kind of dynamic transport service, how many people will use it? And will this service be enough to really move all the people we want to move? And uh, for this, we need agent-based models where we model each person in detail, because then we can understand what is the detailed spatial and temporal interaction of the user with the service. We know exactly when the user wants to go from A to B. We know exactly the location. And then we can simulate a service that is bringing the user from one place to the other. We don't talk about the uh, aggregated zones, but we do all of this in detail. So this is basically the idea behind agent-based models. And it's responding to this changed way we, we want to plan our transport systems and how we want to control them. So we use discrete locations, individual travelers, they have specific behaviors as we um, observe them in reality. And especially also we want to look at the whole day because if we want to make this transport system more efficient, it's not uh, sufficient to only look at the, at the peak hours because these fleets are there. They're in, they're in the morning, they're also there during the day. So the question is how can we make the most out of these services at any time during the day? This is why it's interesting to look at these agent-based models. Now, one of these agent-based models is MATSIM, which um, is used uh, heavily in academia. So the major contributors to this uh, open source transport simulation framework is ETH Zurich and uh, TU Berlin. Now, where I'm working now at ERT System X, we also have started a lot of projects on uh, MATSIM, but there are many universities around the world uh, that are also using it. So there are over 50 research groups um, that uh, make use of it. And also there's an increased interest by companies. Um, so here you see a small collection of industrial users of the system. 
Um, the largest is probably the Swiss Federal Railways because they are interested in having a next to their macroscopic uh, annual planning architecture, they want to have systems where they can analyze how to optimally deploy, for instance, feeder services to the, to the station to um, serve people in a dynamic way. And this is exactly a use case for agent-based simulation because you want to understand this dynamic interaction between the customer and the service and how to control the service optimally. So how does it work or what does it uh, do? Usually we start with a synthetic demand. So this is basically what we saw before. So we have persons that do certain activities during the day at certain times, and they use uh, different transport modes to get from A to B to fulfill these activities. This we call a synthetic demand because it tells us what this population, synthetic population wants to do. Um, and then we perform the mobility simulation. So this is one large component of MATSIM. Each link that you see in the road network is simulated as a queue. Vehicles enter the queue after a certain time, they exit the queue. And there are certain constraints on how many vehicles can go through a link in a certain time period. So you have kind of capacity constraints that you also observe in reality. So this way we actually also simulate congestion, for instance. So if too many vehicles want to use the same link in the network, congestion will build up and you will also have spillback effects in the network. This is kind of the agent-based traffic simulation. Then, based on one simulated day, agents can change their plans. So there's a decision-making component. So for instance, if this person was using the car before um, to go from home to, to university and then going to eat something and going back home, this person may have said now, well, um, there was a lot of congestion. I, uh, it took me a long time to go from A to B. So now I want to use the train here and then this uh, short distance here, I can just walk and then I take the train back home. And um, then the agent will make this decision and we have an updated synthetic travel demand with the updated plans of the agents. We do a simulation again. Uh, we have new travel times, new congestion patterns, agents make decisions again, and so on. So basically, this is kind of a loop. And if we run this loop long enough, the decisions of the agents will stabilize. And basically, we have then an equilibrium state where all the agents have reacted to the transport system and have made the decisions that give them the highest utility. What we then see is, for instance, if we do a simulation of uh, automated taxis, for instance, that we start at zero requests if we just in, introduce the service and then kind of the usage of the service increases until it stabilizes at some point. This is basically the idea. If we now introduce a new metro line, a new service to the system, we can basically observe how people react to it and how they make use of it. Um, and afterwards, after we have introduced all these changes, we can do analysis. We can do an analysis of a baseline simulation. We can analysis. Uh, we can do an analysis of the kind of policy case or where we have introduced a new mode of transport, and we can see what have what has changed and what stayed the same. And of course, to set up these simulations, we also perform quite some calibration work. So here, for instance, you see the mode share by different modes like car, public transport, bike, walk by Euclidean distance and you see reference values which come usually from a survey and then what we obtain in the simulation. And this is how we make sure that our simulations actually give something that is realistic. So now having uh, this in place, um, knowing now how the simulation works, the question is how can we simulate autonomous uh, vehicles in Zurich? And uh, here, we really wanted to use this full framework where we can really observe the agent behavior and what uh, will be the system impact at the end. So in the beginning of this project that we did there in Zurich uh, was three questions. So first of, of all, what are the cost structures of such uh, service? So how much will it cost to operate this, uh, a fleet of automated taxis in Zurich? Then the second question was, how would people use this? For this, um, my colleagues were performing a large survey in the canton of Zurich. 
And then came the simulation as the last part, because if we put these two things together, agents can make use of a certain service with a certain cost attached to it. Based on this cost, they make decisions. And then in the simulation, we can see how many people would use the service with which waiting times and so on. So this was the basic idea. So there are some numbers for the first two steps to begin with. So in a first study that my colleagues did, um, they looked into all the components that make up a certain mobility offer in Switzerland and um, summed them up to get to the full price per passenger kilometer or the cost per passenger kilometer for this service. So if you look here, we have two colors, autonomous and not autonomous. So first uh, we can, since we looked at Zurich, we can look at the urban case here. We have the bus, for instance, cost 53 uh, rappen per kilometer today. If the service is automated and the driver wages fall away, this will can be reduced uh, to half. This is what this study finds. Now for the private car, it actually finds that the cost stays roughly the same, even a bit more because technology will be more expensive according to this study. But the largest effect you see here in the individual taxi. So today in Switzerland, a kilometer costs around 2 francs 73. If this system is automated, so if we have automated taxis, this will cost 41 rappen. So this tells us if the technology is ready and there's somebody who wants to offer this service, there's a large uh, economic incentive because such taxis, they could offer it much more cheaper than today's taxis. So if somebody, if the technology is ready, there will probably be an operator who wants to try it to offer such a service. And so we want to be ready and understand what will happen in this case. Now, the next thing was a uh, stated preference uh, survey that has been performed in the canton of Zurich. And there in the first phase, people were asked to give a certain regular trip that they do during a normal day. So this person was saying, okay, maybe to get to work, they use the car, it takes 30 minutes and it costs uh, seven francs. Um, and in the second phase, this person was provided a couple of options to choose from as alternatives. So for instance, there's a private automated car, but there's also the automated taxi service. And there, uh, my colleagues were varying the attributes. So here you see, for instance, this would have a total travel time of 25 minutes, but it is split up in 20 minutes of transport time, in vehicle time, and five minutes of waiting time. And it would cost 12 francs. So the person can now make a decision and there would also be other choice situation with different uh, travel times, different waiting times and so on. And in each case, we would see, would the person take their car or would they choose a different mode of transport? And based on this, we can estimate uh, statistical choice models, which give us information about, well, at which, if we have a certain travel time for the car, for public transport, for bike, for the automated taxi, waiting time for the automated taxi, which of these modes would they choose? So these are basically choice models that we can estimate. And these choice models give us an interesting analysis, just to do this a bit high level here, which is the value of travel time savings. And the value of travel time savings is quantifying a bit how much, how costly do people perceive uh, the time spent in transport? So in Switzerland, this comes from many previous studies also, people usually perceive being in the car, traveling in the car as if they would pay 19 francs per hour. Um, so th this is just the value that usually people find. And in comparison to that, people perceive being in transport with around 12 francs per hour. Put another way, this means that people usually feel more comfortable in the public transport. So it, it is perceived as a less of a burden to spend a couple of minutes in public transport than to spend the same amount of time in the car. And usually this is the case because in the car you have to drive, you have to concentrate. In the bus or in the train, especially in Switzerland, it's usually quite comfortable. You can read your newspaper or uh, work on your laptop and so on. So usually this is perceived as less costly. 
And what comes out of this study now is that the automated taxi is perceived at 13 francs per hour, which is much closer to the public transport than to the conventional car. So again, here we see if technology is ready, we already saw that the cost of operating such a system are highly competitive to the conventional taxis, but also to the private car. And here we see that people would actually be happy to use it. If they can switch from their car to this automated car, they understand they can do different activities. So they would actually be willing to use the service. So this is a good situation for the operator who wants to try to put in place such a service. Another aspect <clears throat> that comes out from the survey is when we do the same analysis with waiting time. So here now you see the, the value of waiting time in Switzerland. So this is usually at 21 francs per hour. So people usually don't like to wait for the bus or for the train, but they even they like to wait even less for the automated taxi. So this is valued here at 32 francs per hour. And this is also an insight for the operator. The operator really should try to minimize waiting time for the customer because otherwise they don't want to use the service. And with these components, we were setting up our uh, modeling infrastructure. So what we have here is our mobility simulation in Matsim. Um, from there, then we can predict certain things. So for the automated taxi, we can predict what would be the travel time for a trip from A to B. What would be the waiting time if I want to depart at a certain time of the day in a certain area in the city. Also, we can estimate in the previous iteration, what was the utilization of this automated taxi fleet, how much of empty distance did we have, how much of customer distance and so on. And we can feed this information to this cost calculator. And depending on how well the fleet is utilized and in which way, it will give us a price that would cover the cost of the service. So we are talking about the cost covering uh, taxi service here. And this would go into a discrete choice model based on the survey. So the decisions of the agents here will be based on this price and the travel times and the waiting times and also the travel times for the other modes of transport. We would have a new set of trips that need to be simulated. We perform the mobility simulation leading maybe now to more people using the service leading to higher waiting times. With these higher waiting times, we do another choice. And then at some point we kind of stabilize at a certain level of waiting times, travel times and price. This all goes into equilibrium at some point. Now, the interesting thing here is that if we have looked at literature before this study, is that we usually saw simulation setups like this. You would have a certain demand, for instance, all the car trips in a certain city. Then we have, we simulate a fleet of taxis that pick up and drop off people. And we increase this fleet size and the waiting time goes down. And at some point in these studies, usually we say, okay, there's a limit of five minutes. And then we say, okay, this is a sufficient number. If on average wait times are five minutes, then this service has the, a sufficient size. Now, this is only half uh, the story because as said, we choose, for instance, all the car trips in the city, all the public transport trips in the city. So basically, independent of the fleet size, the demand stays constant. This was all the studies before we did these experiments here. But what we did now is that we say, well, the choice whether to use the service depends on other factors. For instance, here, if we look at really small fleet sizes, this means that waiting times will be really high. It's an unreliable service. So actually the demand should be small. If we look at really large fleet sizes, somehow the cost of operating the system must be fed back to the customer if there are no subsidies. So this should be really expensive. So also again, not a lot of people should use it. And at the end, we should see something like a demand curve if we vary the fleet size in our simulation. And this was the aim of this study. And this we could do with this simulation setup that I was just showing you because the choices are based dynamic on the offer that is provided and both of them go into equilibrium. Now, when we do these simulations, we can visualize them. So here you see all the taxis driving around in Zurich. You see pickup and drop-offs of people. And this is nice to look at. 
and uh, it's a nice way to make some background slides for presentations. But what we are usually interested in are then the macroscopic measures. So here they are. And uh, the interesting plot is in the upper left corner because this is exactly the demand curve I was just talking about. So in our simulations now we see if we have very small fleet sizes in Zurich, the demand, so this is the number of requests here, is rather low. It then increases up to a certain point where we have the maximum demand that we can attract with our uh, service and then it uh, decreases again. So here we see over all the fleet sizes that we tested, we never go across or over a certain maximum demand that we have. And it's slightly dependent on whether we impose a base fare or not to the price. The interesting thing is now that many things go into equilibrium here. So you see that uh, at this maximum demand fleet size of 5,000 vehicles here, for instance, we see that in equilibrium, we have a waiting time of around 2.5 minutes on average. So this is what people are willing to accept according to the choice models that we have estimated. And then depending on, like, let's say, if we don't have a base fare, people would be willing to pay 70 rappen, which is also interesting because this is more or less the full cost of uh, operating a private car in uh, Switzerland. Sebastian, and, can, I, can I interrupt you? There is a sure. question from the audience, and maybe maybe it's it's good to answer it while it's fresh. Okay. Uh, I think it is a question. Sab Sabir, you have a hands up. Feel free I do. To, yeah. Yeah. Feel free to it, ask your question directly. Thank you so much. I think this is a question just about the two slides that the two charts that we're looking at, Sebastian. Mm -hmm. Um, just so we understand these better. So, um, are these simulated or are they? based on the surveys that you ran like how how so so these are simulated request how would request data be affected by a fleet size if the consumers are or are not fully aware of what your actual fleet size is so what we get from the based on the fleet size and the utilization so first of all these are simulation results so okay. these are simulation results now and uh, so what we see here is this distance fare is basically calculated on how the fleet is uh, utilized. So you have a fixed cost per vehicle per day, you have cost per kilometer, and you have cost per trip. These are mainly like cleaning costs that you have in this service. Actually, in this cost study, they, they found that a lot of car sharing services and so on actually they spend a lot of uh, money in um, cleaning their vehicles. So this is how we then calculate uh, the price because we have the cost for the fleet for one day. We have um, given a certain price or we can then calculate what is the price that would cover the cost. And then in the next iteration, we impose this price and people will make decision based on this price. And also given the utilization of the fleet, people will experience certain waiting times and they are also fed back into this choice model. So the people make their choice based on the waiting times that they expect and the price um, that, uh, that is imposed by the system. Then they make their choices, waiting times, distance fares, and so on can change. And then we do this multiple iterations until everything stabilizes. And these are the results after we have run many iterations and the system has stabilized. Um, and the interesting thing is that the fleet size is the input variable here. So input, the fleet size is fixed. So each of these points that we see here are equilibrium points. So if we have a fleet size of 1000, we have a certain number of requests. Uh, these requests, they accept a certain waiting time and the fleet is offered at a certain price. But the same is true if we have 8,000 vehicles, then we have a different number of requests we have much lower waiting times, but on the other hand, the price is much higher. But in any case, these are equilibrium points. So as a policymaker now, you could choose where on this line do you want to be? Do you want to have a service with high waiting times, but which is affordable for everybody? Or do you want to have a service that um, has very low waiting times, but is rather expensive? And this is uh, interesting. Uh, inside from the policy perspective. But we did additional analysis. 
So these are kind of the standard things that you see in, in papers that look into control of mobility systems. So over the day, we then can see where do we have the peaks of the waiting time, which is not a big surprise, which is in the morning hours and in the evening hours. And we can see when do we have requests of people using these services. We can actually see also in the afternoon, there's quite a larger demand than in the morning because also the service would be used for quite some uh, leisure activities here in the afternoon. Now, one interesting result that came out of here is we also estimated or measured the road distance from these uh, simulations. And what we saw compared to the baseline case where people use their car, public transport, bike, and they can also walk, we have an increase or almost a doubling of uh, distance driven on the roads, which is uh, bad news because every kilometer driven on the road uh, produces a certain cost for the people who maintain the infrastructure, which in Switzerland would be the, the, the Federal Office of Roads, for instance. And um, so this shows that uh, there is a space for improvement for such a system. Um, one thing that may trade off this increase of distance is that we say, OK, maybe we have emptied the, the city a lot. So there's a lot of space freed up that we can use to, to make parks and so on. So we also looked at this. But then we see, for instance, here with a fleet set of 3,000 vehicles in Zurich, we can um, reduce the number of vehicles that are used on the streets of Zurich during one day by 13% which is not that much compared to this immense increase in road distance driven. So then the question is, where does this distance come from that we see here with this taxi service? And uh, this we uh, looked at in this analysis. So here you have the baseline case where you see how many vehicles use a certain road um, uh, per day. And there you can see that uh, we have these large arterials here in Zurich, and then we have all these blue areas, which are kind of the res residential areas where we don't have so many uh, vehicles um, per hour. And then if we look at the change from the baseline case to the case where we have automated taxis, we see that these are actually these areas, these residential areas, which are blue on the, on the left side, those are the ones who have the highest increase in distance driven in this case where we have automated taxis. And the reason is if somebody was using the car or maybe even the public transport before, now when these automated taxis are there, to get from A to B, a taxi needs to come, use these residential roads to pick this person up, then goes back on these residential roads to the work. At work, you have the same story, the vehicle will leave. And then when the person wants to, wants to depart in the afternoon, the vehicle needs to come again, uses these roads, then takes the person, goes back home, and also twice uses the, the roads. And this is basically how this large increase of distance comes, because whenever somebody wants to use this door-to-door -door service, a vehicle needs to first come and then bring the person somewhere. And you have the same on the way back. Um, but this is kind of, you can call it an artifact, because we use this kind of single passenger taxis here, um, which really offer a door-to-door -door service. But it, poses uh, kind of ideas how to improve the system, for instance, by putting dedicated drop-off points, which are maybe not in residential areas, improving intermodality of the system, letting them use kind of uh, automated taxis and trains in combination, uh, or uh, using pooling. So this is one of the major things that would kind of need to be added on top of this study. And we are working in this direction. Um, also operational constraints, like what if these vehicles need to recharge, uh, there are spatial constraints. So if we especially look at intermodality at some point where we have connections between trains and taxis, will there even be enough of space, for instance, in Zurich train station when a train with hundreds of people arrives and everybody wants to use a taxi? So these are all kind of open questions, but which could be uh, answered by extending uh, this simulation framework that we have set up here. And uh, especially now, since uh, this is the autonomy talk here, um, we have done a study together with Claudio Ruch um, already some time ago, where we did similar studies and used different fleet control algorithms. And there you also have 
a degree of freedom how you want to operate your fleet. So what you see here is different fleet operating strategies. So how do you move your vehicle from, from A to B and how do you re redistribute them in the system? And there you see the different colors for different strategies. And you can see, for instance, here we have one strategy, which is green, which um, has a high share of empty distance because vehicles are constantly redistributed. So they uniformly are distributed over the system. And uh, this causes then, if we look here at wait times and the price uh, of the service to, to a case where we have uh, quite low uh, wait times compared to, for instance, this orange one here, which is global bipartite matching, which is minimizing the empty distance. But because of this, if you look at any point of waiting time here, we are always at a higher price than um, the, 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 the services than, than the other um, service operating policies. So there's always a trade-off to make, and this is but this is kind of a trade-off on the on the operator side if you want to trade empty distance against uh, waiting time in a certain way. Okay, so these are the simulations for automated taxis that we did in Zurich, but now. This has been published in, in, a, in a paper, uh, but the question is, can we replicate this? And the answer for Zurich is, well, not so easily because we used a lot of data sets which are uh, offered by public authorities, but which cannot be accessed by anybody. Um, however, we have solved this problem in other cases. But first, I want to show a bit what is even the effort in coming up with such a simulation. Because for, until now, I have shown you how we simulate the automated taxis, but I didn't talk about how do we even come up with this demand? How do we come up with all the things that people do during one day? And this I want to show in the, with the um, example of, uh, well, actually, I was writing Paris. Actually, I think the example is about Lyon now. So we want to create a synthetic travel demand. And what we do in France is we start with the population census to put people on the map and also to group them into households and to add for each of these individuals social demographic attributes. And then we kind of know where they live, what kind of uh, gender they have, what kind of age they have, and so on. In the second step, we add some income to those people. For this in France, we have a database called Philosophy, which is a kind of a national tax database that we can use and based on the social demographic attributes of the households, we can add a certain income because this is important for the simulation later on. Now, third point, since we know where people live, we can use another data set that is available in France, which is basically a large OD matrix for commuting trips. And we can say if somebody lives in a certain zone, in a certain municipality, what is the probability that they are working in any other municipality? And we can sample these locations to find where do these people work or where do they go to school? Um, then having this information, we can attach an activity chain to them. And for this, we use household travel service. So a household travel survey is a survey where somebody will call you and they tell you for a certain reference day, they will ask you, what did you do? And then you would say, okay, in the morning I was uh, at home. Then I took my car going to work. I arrived at 8.30. I stayed there until five. Then I took the car back home. And in the survey, they would ask in Switzerland, there's for instance, the micro census mobility that they would ask 60,000 people to give their daily activity chains. And using this, then we can uh, attach this information to our uh, synthetic population. So what we do here is with this uh, French one uh, of such a household travel survey, we check all the activity chains we have. We check what are the social demographic attributes of the respondents in the survey. And then for each of our synthetic persons that we have generated, we find an activity chain that fits to those social demographic attributes and we attach this chain to the person. What this gives is that for instance, children will have different activity chains than their parents. Then we need to decide where do these activities happen? Because now we know structurally what do they want to do, but we don't know yet where do they perform these activities. 
In France, France, we have a database which is called Siren, which is a census of all enterprises in France. There we have the address of the enterprises and we have BD Topo, which is a large address database of France where you have kind of the written address and the exact coordinates. And by combining these two data sets, we can find where are all the places where you can eat, where you can perform a shopping activity, where you can perform leisure activities. And we can also put all these different uh, enterprises, all these different opportunities on the map, and then we attach um, these locations to the activity chains so the distance distributions of these people make sense. So what we then have is basically a synthetic population where we have persons with social demographic attributes and home locations. With this, we can already do many analysis. We can check how many people live within 50 minutes uh, distance or 50 kilometers distance of a hospital, for instance. And what is the social demographic structure of these people who have access to the, to the hospital? And we have activity chains for each of these person, which is telling us in detail what did this or what would this synthetic person do during one day, at which time and at which location. With this, we can, for instance, check how many people are working at a certain time in a certain area and so on. So just the synthetic population, synthetic travel demand gives us a rich um, uh, variety of analysis that we can do. What we then usually do is also use OpenStreetMap data and the digital transit schedules in GTFS format to set up the whole simulation. And this would then be the full Matsim simulation. And this we can then run. And here you see, for instance, a simulation of Lyon. So where you have all these blue bubbles, this is where people perform work activities. You see all the cars moving here in the background in gray and the black dots, these are all the public transport uh, vehicles, all the metro vehicles. Now, the interesting thing here is that all the data sets except this one here are blue and blue means open data and publicly accessible. So here we had this detailed household travel survey for Lyon, which we can use in our pipeline that we have developed here, but we don't need to. There's also a national household travel survey, which is also open and publicly available. And what is interesting here now is that we have all these open data sets, which we use to create the synthetic travel demand. All the software to transform this into a synthetic population is open source. Also the Matsum simulation later on is open source. So basically this whole pipeline is open source, which makes it completely reproducible. And we can do kind of integrated testing. We can verify the results and so on. And this is really a novelty because uh, studies on agent-based uh, transport simulation, usually they start looking at some interesting thing, automated taxis, urban air mobility, and so on, but they cannot really explain in one paper how actually did this synthetic uh, travel demand emerge. And this is what we did now here, and everybody can re replicate exactly. So if you go online, you can exactly create such a synthetic travel demand for France download all the data sets, and then do your analysis with it. And this has been published recently, which was a bit of a struggle because a lot of reviewers said, well, this is nothing new. There's already a lot of agent-based simulations, but then our argument always was, well, but nobody explains in detail and in an open way how such a synthetic travel demand really can be created. So we are quite happy that uh, we managed to publish this. And <clears throat> also, there's a lot of other adaptations now. So here we were talking about Lyon, uh, because all of these data sets are available for the whole of France. Um, we can also create po populations for Paris. We can create populations for Rennes, for Nantes, uh, for Toulouse. So this is really flexible in France now, and there have already been a lot of uh, publications based on this. And we have applied the same methodology to many places worldwide. So the largest one or the most known so far are for Sao Paulo and for California, where we could apply almost exactly the same pipeline, just with a little bit of different data sets, which shows that data is becoming more and more available worldwide, although not every country is as far as France. For instance, in Switzerland, we had access to really a detailed population data. 
but this gives really in detail the coordinates of the home locations of 8 million Swiss residents. So this is not at all anonymized. So it's difficult to publish uh, things based on this. While in France, then authorities publish these data, make it available for research, but also apply sufficient anonymization. Now, just some more examples here. Then, for instance, we can look to simulations of emissions in Paris, also with Matsim. So here we see how emissions are produced on all the roads in the city. We can look at projects like the Grand Paris Express, which is something we are doing right now. And we can repeat similar studies as we did in Zurich. So here we also uh, did simulations which had the same structure as the ones that I was so showing for Zurich. And there we basically found that um, if we have this dynamic case here, we have a maximum demand of trips for an automated taxi system in Paris, which would be around 1.2 million with a fleet size of 25,000 vehicles. So clearly these studies are conceptual and I don't know if we will ever see 25,000 automated taxis on the streets of Paris. Many people would say, let's, let's hope not. Um, but this is basically just a rough number that gives us a magnitude and we will see what the future brings. And uh, with this, uh, I hope this was interesting. I could give you some pointers if you're interested in applications for Matsim, synthetic populations, if you maybe want to try the data sets, um, make use of it and so on, then feel free to contact me. And uh, yeah, I think now we still have time for a couple of questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, for the great talk. Is there any question from the audience? If yes, you can unmute yourself and just talk. Um, hi, Sebastian. Uh, I have a question. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, can you also simulate parking? So parking with the, with the vehicles in the, the Matsim? Um, so, so, yes. Um, it's, it's not like a really... So Matsim is kind of an open ecosystem, I would say. So there's usually a lot of components for a lot of different things in Matsim. There are multiple approaches of uh, simulating parking. So the simplest would be in, in kind of in your choice model, you just say, okay, it takes a certain time for the person to park. So there's another penalty for when, when they assess, is, is it interesting to use the car, for instance. But then there are more explicit approaches where then the cars really will drive around to find a parking spot um, for, the, for the standard users with their private cars. So this exists. Um, it's just not out of the box functionality, but uh, you will surely find examples for that. Um, the other question is, if we look at these uh, automated uh, taxi services or on-demand services, there, for instance, we have just uh, published a paper uh, with um, Milos Balaj and Claudio Ruf, where we looked at different uh, parking strategies for automated taxis in Zurich. Uh, this, this was published like some, some months ago. So, so this is there, but with on-demand systems, it's easier because there's not so much of behavioral uh, decisions included there. As an operator, you basically say, okay, when the vehicle doesn't have a customer, you send it to a certain spot, and then you kind of define where are your parking spots, for instance. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I, I was assuming that there is a uh, possibility, but I didn't know that the explicit parking um, yeah, and for on demand services, you also have uh, charging functionality. Yeah, exactly. and so yeah. There's quite a quite a lot of different things. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, I have. Um, in case nobody has, I have a couple. Um, one thing I always ask me. So you 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 said the intermodal is in the future work adapting uh, the frame, frameworks to consider intermodal. And now the, maybe the funny question, but is there any reason why you didn't do it earlier? Like, you, you, don't you, you don't think it captures uh, a lot of what could happen in the future? No, we, uh, I think it was, there was just not the, the, the time to do it in the, in, the, in the projects that we had done. I think uh, Claudio, he was looking uh, with, um, 
what's his name? Nicolo, I think he was a master's student. They were looking at uh, intermodal operations. And I mean, there's already quite a lot of literature on the topic. Um, well, it's, it's not a question of implementation. So there's a couple of implementation and it's it's not difficult to do this with Matsing. Um, it's just a kind of, we personally have not uh, published any paper on this with the scenarios that uh, we have checked, but it would be relatively easy to, to do this based on top or on top of this framework. Um, yeah, I think one interesting is aspect there is, which is maybe also a bit missing in literature is um, how to do this reliably that you say you connect uh, your automated taxi with public transport, but then you need to guarantee that the person arrives on time. Otherwise the service doesn't make sense. And therefore, for instance, here at uh, ERT System X, um, uh, we have a PhD student who is looking into these kind of algorithms, which give guarantees on uh, switching to public transport uh, in combination with uh, reinforcement learning for fleet control. So let's see what comes out there. I think this will be quite interesting. Yes, uh, uh, I also think it would be interesting also because in the this evolutionary approach in which people change mind, it's, it would be nice to see what happens when you have multiple companies offering different services and people might change idea from one to the other. Um, and another question out of curiosity is, uh, Usually, I, I, I read a lot of your papers, and I, I always see that you have certain regions in which the autonomous vehicles offer the services. Have you tried uh, looking at optimizations of areas of service? Let's say I am a company. Does it make sense for me to offer the service citywide, or maybe should I just offer it in some neighborhoods? Or yeah. have, have you looked at these kind of studies? Uh, no, we didn't. But, but it would be it would be interesting. Um, there are some studies from the people in, in Berlin who are uh, developing Maxim. They were kind of doing ser service area design. I think like two years ago, it, it was a paper. I think there they use, but real on-demand services, not, not autonomous, kind of human driven. Um, so in principle, this is this is possible. I, th I think there are many um, applications of these kind of uh, setups where you have kind of a Matsim simulation, but you kind of have an auto optimization loop, which, for instance, proposes different operating areas. Uh, often it's a question of runtime also, because these Matsim simulations take quite long. And then you have this auto optimization loop. Uh, but we are also in the process of um, kind of streamlining this process. Uh, not so much in the sense of kind of optimizing certain inputs for the simulation, but for calibration, because it's the same setup. We kind of, we need to change parameters, then run the Matsim simulation, see the outcome, compare with the reference, for instance, in Mochess, propose new parameters and so on. So it's kind of the same principle. And we are also working on this in an in a ongoing project, which has quite promising results. Very cool. Excited to see what happens there. Um, so let's see, maybe somebody has another question in the meantime. I want to take the stage. Does it seem so? It's a quiet audience today, still in vacation a bit. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. I think you gave your coordinates in case people want to reach out for questions or many, maybe deeper analysis of, of, of what you did. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was great having it after the very, you have to know people in the audience that uh, we scheduled this talk in the early days of autonomy talks and <laughs> now for for many reasons then uh, we didn't end up doing it and now we are happy that <laughs> we yep. kept the promise yes uh thank you very much sebastian good luck for your next adventures and uh, see you all next week actually no in two weeks for the next talk yeah thank, thank you, you for much. the invitation and thank you for thank you the audience. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.